Good afternoon. I'm Carol Christ. I'm the Interim Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this faculty seminar. Uh, Mike McPherson is one of the wisest people I know. I first got to meet him when I was at Smith College when he did some very important consulting for the college and um, have read with great attention um, everything that he's written, everything that he says about higher education. He's the fifth president of the Spencer Foundation, um, just now stepping down from his position in, in our own Naila Nasir, which I'm so both happy for the Spencer Foundation and very sad for the Berkeley campus will succeed him. I hadn't realized the Spencer Foundation was um, so comparatively recent a, a foundation. He was also president of McAllister College um, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, or is it in the St. Paul? St. Paul. It's in St. Paul, Minnesota. And he um, is a product of the legendary, well, not a product of, he was a faculty member in the legendary economics department at Williams College. He was also dean of the faculty at Williams, but Mike was telling me yesterday that at one point, out of the 10 members of the economics department, 11. 11, four of them have become subsequently college presidents. So it's, it's really quite an extraordinary place. And also, at least three of you have done important research on economics and in education. Um, his books are multiple. I'm just going to mention a few of them. Uh, his most recent with Bill Bowen is Lesson Plan. I think it is the single wisest recent book about higher education. I give it to all kinds of people to read, so I'm not really pumping up your book royalties. Um, there's another one called Crossing the Finish Line, which is about what it sounds like it's about. It's about completion rates. Um, and then uh, college Access, Opportunity or Privilege, and Keeping College Affordable, both um, edited um, volumes of essays with Morty Shapiro and I think with others. So please welcome Mike. Um, it's really a treat to have him here. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. I, uh, uh, I attended a, a seminar that, that character uh, Carol is leading here with... Uh, 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 PhD level graduate students who are working on their dissertations related to higher education, which was a great experience for me, wonderful, talented people. And, and Carol introduced me then. So I just want to keep getting introduced by Carol as <laughs> long as I live. <laughs> uh, although I have to say that yesterday she said that I was the wisest person she ever met. Then she heard me talk for an hour, and I've been demoted to one of the <laughs> wisest people. <laughs> By the end of the week, I'm probably not going to want her to introduce me uh, anymore. Uh, well, I, I do very much hope this can, uh, my remarks can blossom into a conversation. And uh, this, this room doesn't necessarily invite conversation. But I hope you will feel free as I ramble to raise questions or uh, offer alternative uh, speeches. Uh, uh, I want to talk about uh, a tricky subject to think about. Uh, and I should say that I'm, I'm, I'm going into some areas where I would not claim to be deep. And I do hope I'll come out of this learning some things I, I didn't know uh, before. But what I really want to talk about is ignorance uh, in this sense that uh, we have good general reasons to believe that developments in technology are going to transform a lot about life in the United States and, uh, and in the rest of the world. And it would be astonishing if that weren't true within higher education. It's, it's certainly going to be the case. It has already been the case in some parts of higher education. Uh, but I think we know a lot less than we sometimes let ourselves believe about what form those things are going to take, how quickly these changes are going to occur, and through what mechanisms they will develop. Uh, and when I listen to people talking about the technological future of higher education, they generally sound really sure about what's going to happen. Uh, and I, I don't, I just don't know where that degree of confidence arises. Uh, 
<laughs> uh, it's not limited to Silicon Valley, but I, I understand that. And I understand the advantages uh, for various purposes of definitive stances. Uh, uh, many, many years ago, I, I read a book of short stories by Thomas Pynchon. Uh, this was something he pulled together after having published you know, his, his great quasi-science fictional uh, uh, difficult books. And it was called Slow Learner. And in the preface to the book, he said that uh, he felt like his process of intellectual development was not so much that he learned things he hadn't known, but that he developed better maps of his ignorance. What was the nature of the things he didn't really know? And that, that thought has stuck in my head for probably 40 years, uh, maps of your ignorance. And you know, if you're just looking at a kind of a blank slate, that's one thing. But if, if you understand the planetary system and you understand galaxies and so on, you have no chance of understanding dark matter. But you understand what it is that you don't understand. You know, you have a map of your ignorance. You know the stuff in the universe that is kind of known, and you know the stuff in the universe that you're ignorant about, which is really different from the condition people were in a 1,000 years ago uh, when they had no clue about any of this. So uh, I kind of want to. I mean, it would be ambitious to say I want to map our ignorance here. But what I'd like to do is illustrate with some examples that are outside of education, and outside of higher education, uh, and uh, then make a few remarks about what the bearings might be within uh, uh, higher education. Uh, so one thing I would note, and this is something that uh, uh, Bob Gordon wrote in his very uh, skeptical book. Bob is an economic historian called uh, The Rise and Decline, I think, of, or Rise and Fall, maybe, of Economic Growth. I don't, Bob, Bob sort of says everything's been invented. And that seems to me to be a crazy thing to believe, uh, and that we can never again have things that were as dramatically important as what we had. Uh, I don't want to talk about that side of his argument, but. What's really cool in that book is there is a, a real, well-developed history of the great period of economic development and growth that was driven by technological change. Uh, uh, one thing that Bob notes, I think rightly, is that some areas, uh, uh, technical change, even though you might expect it to continue, has really pretty much stopped. Uh, and the great example here from him is air travel. The only thing that's happened to air travel in the last 50 years is it's gotten cheaper and radically more unpleasant. Uh, uh, <laughs> recent news <laughs> suggests some of the features of that. But the fact is, uh, nobody has figured out a practical, acceptable way to break the speed limit that's now set by the, the sound barrier for passenger travel. I mean, I guess if you really need to get to Dubai, you can get an F-16 and slam there really quickly. But the attempts to do that uh, in commercial aviation have flopped. And we have bigger planes, so we can squeeze even more people in. We don't have faster planes, and that's basically the constraint. I think it's also true, though Bob doesn't talk about this, that uh, there's a lot of excitement for good reasons, and I'll come back to this, about autonomous cars, driverless cars, driverless trucks. Uh, but any economist, I think, would agree that the major cost, the biggest cost of automobile travel is the time you spend unproductively as a passenger or a driver of a car. You're not going to do very much about that at all. At all. You're going to save money on taxi rides. Uh, you know, push, push the cost of uh, making a car available to you for a short trip down even further than Uber is pushing it down by losing billions of dollars a year sitting 
prices <laughs> that don't cover costs. Uh, uh, but you're not going to fundamentally reduce the main cost of auto travel, which is cars don't go all that fast, uh, safely, in cities. Uh, it's, you're still, even when you wouldn't got autonomous cars, you're not going to want to hit the Bay Bridge at 4 p.m. Uh, uh, unless there are some further developments, which I will, I will say a speculative word about. Uh, so there are areas which suggest that change is not necessarily going to be as pervasive as the so-called techno-optimists suggest. But at the same time, it would be crazy to think, you know, we've checked all the boxes. Everything really interesting has already been done. Uh, now, the questions about the future of technology and the future of other things are uh, often answered by futurists. I have a distant relative who is a professional futurist. Uh, and he makes a lot of money. Uh, you know, he gets hired to go to uh, big conventions and spend an hour telling people what the future is going to be like. And He's, he's written some books, which I've tried to read. And uh, as near as I can tell, his message is, if you think the future is going to be like the past, you're in trouble. Because what we know is things are going to change. And so the important thing to do is get ready for change. Thank you very much. That'll be $10,000. <laughs> 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 uh, so I've always preferred pastists to futurists. They used to call pastists historians. Uh, and this is one of the places where, where Bob and others, I think, are really valuable. Because the path of innovation is full of surprises and takes almost always longer to have its productive effects than you think it will. Uh, now, maybe you know, smart machines change everything. Maybe the internet changes everything. But generally, I'm inclined to bet on the past being a better guide to the future than pure speculation is. So I want to illustrate this by first coming back to uh, the automobile. Uh, and uh, David Otter, who is a wonderful economist at MIT who does uh, work on labor and the future of work, has noted that often the success of an invention requires the construction of an environment which supports the use of that invention. And the great example for automobiles is for automobiles to work, we had to pave the country. The, the roads that uh, wagons could be dragged along on by horse hooves would not support uh, cars with inflated tires and springs. Uh, you had to change a tire every very, very often. Automobiles got a head start because bicycles came first. And bicycles also required some paving. But the project of paving the country was only completed in the mid-1970s with the interstate highway system, which was a huge infrastructure investment that certainly raised dramatically the value of the automobile for productive purposes, and the truck as well. Uh, now, I think there's a, this is not anything <laughs> any I ever read. So uh, somebody here can probably tell me I'm wrong. But uh, I do know this, that people, people who know more about this have told me that the way it's now anticipated, one of the possible ways that autonomous trucking could arrive is that uh, it's, it's driving on an interstate autonomously is pretty straightforward. And uh, a possible thought is that you will have something on the internet like a separate lane for autonomous vehicles. And that lane will be filled with sensors that will ensure that you're, you're not going to be hung up by terrible weather conditions, which now I think is one of the big challenges for autonomous driving to conquer. 
uh, you have a separate lane, you have a driver, much like a tugboat driver bring it, that Mark Twain wrote about, bringing in a pilot to bring in a, a barge on the Mississippi River. So you have a driver to take the truck, to load the truck, take the truck to the internet, hook the truck up, get in the back seat, and go to sleep. Until either some event happens that requires the, the truck to wake up the driver, and the driver wakes up and finds he's on the side of the road and has to figure out what to do about it. Or until you get to the getting off the internet, and then the driver drives the truck and unloads it. That's a perfectly reasonable model. And uh, although everybody is building their own autonomous cars with their own designs, or at least they're supposed to be, I guess there is some legal question about whether that's actually happening in a couple cases. Uh, but uh, it does seem like there are going to be big payoffs to having autonomous vehicles communicate with one another in a common language. And it does seem like there's probably going to be real value in having city streets with sensors that will communicate with all these autonomous vehicles. Which to me suggests we may just need to repave the country uh, to get the most out of these vehicles. And the gains, of course, if every vehicle can talk to every other vehicle, are tremendous because you can be super close together because you know what the other vehicle is going to do. Uh, again, you're, you're made invulnerable to most road conditions that could get in your way because you're not really driving on the road. You're going to be driving on the sensors. Uh, this is just my, my little made up thing. But I think there's going to have to be a lot of infrastructure investment to support autonomous driving in cities. That is going to be a public good. And public goods are hard to finance in the United States. So I think there's a real challenge there. It took 20 years for, for, car, for the internal combustion engine to really realize itself when enough stuff had been paved and reliability had, had uh, uh, risen enough. So uh, I think that's an area where there's obviously going to be great advances, but where there probably is a need to build more of an environment than, than we have done. Uh, Another thing that Gordon does a great job of describing is that many of the important innovations of the late 19th and first half of the 20th century relied on the building of networks. Uh, uh, indoor plumbing and water supply. You know, if you had indoor plumbing to go to your septic tank, that wasn't nearly good enough because your septic tank was a source of flooding, a source of danger, a source of infection. You needed to connect your indoor plumbing to a water supply coming in and to a sewer system going out. Those were public goods investments. And they came pretty quickly, again, about 20 years or so uh, uh, in big cities. They came much more slowly to the countryside. And of course, they're not everywhere even now. The electrical system for homes, uh, you know, one of the big projects of the New Deal was rural electrification, the TVA and all that. Uh, that was well after Edison's invention of the light bulb, which was kind of the, the crucial demonstration that you could, you know, as Bob wonderfully describes, you could flip a switch and a room was lit at night. That's just spectacular, but it doesn't do you much good unless you have electricity in your home. And for everybody to build their own generator was not a viable prospect. So, uh, uh, so it waited again on the production of these tremendous public goods, these utilities, which have be, you know, now are kind of crawling out from under the regulatory umbrella, uh, the telephone. I don't need to say any more than that. Uh, uh, and of course, it was very important that every, every telephone be connected to the same network, which took a long time to figure out. 
uh, uh, and finally, the internet. The internet is a spectacularly important public good. Uh, and the attempts that we're seeing uh, these days, both through big companies like Google and Facebook and through the uh, ISPs who are now getting reversed, the thing that limited their ability to privatize the public good they were supplying, uh, are trying to make private profits off these public goods. Uh, the amazing efforts to prevent cities from building their own citywide wireless networks because they undercut the profits of Comcast uh, is, is really astonishing. Uh, so none of this is easy. And the building of these networks takes time. Uh, and it takes public cooperation. I think that's a really important thing to appreciate. Uh, you know, what Obama got grief for saying that nobody does this on their own. Google didn't, didn't become Google on their own. Google became Google because of DARPA, which developed DARPAnet, which created the, created the possibility of the internet, et cetera. Uh, uh, one other category of challenge is uh, finding business models that realize value from the invention. This is kind of going from invention to innovation is one way that this can be put. But, uh, and these examples come from a wonderful article that was in uh, uh, JAMA about why it's taken a long time for medical technology to improve the information uh, setting for, for doctors and medical care. Uh, electrical power in factories as opposed to in the home. Uh, before you had electrical power in factories, what you had is either water-driven energy or steam-driven energy. And that was transmitted across a large plant through belts and pulleys, which took the energy, was directed to running belt and pulley systems, which then could produce energy in other parts of the plant. And naturally enough, what companies did when the possibility of electric power emerged was they replaced the steam plant with a big electric generator. Uh, and they kept the belts and pulleys. And it took like 20 years before they figured out that distributing small motors across the plant at first each with its own generator later through an electrical wiring system would be much more efficient. And it was only then that the revolution that was implied by electricity really could take off. Uh, uh, there's a similar story about computers in the workplace. Uh, the development of uh, personal computers and microcomputers uh, in the uh, uh, 70s and 80s uh, and into the 90s uh, was undetectable in the rate of productivity growth in the US economy. Bob Solo, the great Nobel laureate economist from MIT, uh, said you can find computers everywhere but in the productivity statistics. And it was only around the mid 90s that you got uh, a distinctive upturn in the rate of productivity growth, which then petered out not long after the dot-com bust in 2002, 2003. Uh, and the reason for that is that what gradually uh, businesses understood is to make the best use of microcomputing facilities, you have to re-engineer the workplace. So if you think about like financial world, I'm a, uh, the head of the overseers at TIAA, and you, you look at what they've done over the years to, to make the processing of your financial data uh, faster, dramatically faster and more reliable uh, because they've just 
eliminated so many steps along the way through direct through processing. Uh, they've eliminated quite a few jobs in doing that, but, but uh, the big challenge was the engineering challenge of figuring out how to direct the workplace to the most productive uses of computers. And, you know, the first, when these things started, you had people sitting at their desks uh, typing out invoices and printing them and walking them over to somebody else's desk. This, this saves you a little bit because you don't have to have a, a secretary do this on a, uh, an old-fashioned typewriter, but it doesn't save you much. And so you need to think about how to transmit, manage the information. Uh, and then, sad to say, productivity growth in the US since the early 2000s has really been terrible. And this year, this past year, for the first time, productivity, labor productivity was actually lower this last year than it was the year before. That hasn't happened for a very long time. So all of this stuff that we're anticipating the impact of, the impact hasn't shown up yet. I do not in any way think that means it's never going to show up. It just means that it's actually taking longer to have a productive impact than we realized it would. And I think we have a kind of distorted lens on this because where there has been a real impact is the daily life of consumers. You know, the, the, you know, instead of watching a terrible TV show at night, you watch Facebook at night. And your, your smartphone is ringing 24 hours a day, whether you want it to or not. You know, our, our active lives, particularly our leisure lives, have really been changed a lot by these technologies. But that's all, all of that is actually a pretty small piece of the economy. That, like, still true, the big pieces of the economy are feeding people, making their clothes, you know, just doing the stuff that lets you live your daily life. Uh, and our entertainment lives have been enriched. But, uh, but not, we haven't seen the effects much more pervasively yet. Uh, so that's, that's my reason for trying to map out the ignorance that we have. Uh, these things operate through different channels. They operate through different time frames. They generally require public involvement as well as private commercial uh, involvement to really reach their fruition. Uh, and uh, we need to recognize those dimensions as we think about the future in higher education. So let me just say a few things about uh, uh, the, uh, the, the future as, as I can see it, or really more about the present as I see it. Uh, the one general point I would note is that uh, it's important to appreciate that the, the information businesses that have been disrupted most readily and most completely are newspapers. Uh, magazines. Those, uh, those kinds of outfits always depended substantially on advertising as a source of revenue. And it's quite clear that the internet provides a form of advertising which is substantially more efficient. You know, the old joke used to be that we know that half of our advertising is completely ineffective, but we don't know which half. Uh, now we do, because we track people, what ads they look at, what ads they respond to. You get a lot of evidence out of that. Uh, it doesn't actually generate a tremendous amount of revenue per uh, connection. But if you get, as with Facebook, if there are billions of people looking at these ads, you don't need any one of them to have very much of an effect to have a big effect overall. Uh, higher education. It's never relied on advertising as a major revenue source. So I think it's, that made the MOOC effort more difficult because the original conception of the MOOC was 
uh, that you would be free of all the institutional constraints. You would market these things on their own. <laughs> and either in classic Silicon Valley fashion, eventually you discover there's a way to make money out of this, or you would make money out of ads. But this has not generated the kind of revenues that would be needed to make these ambitious enterprises really function as freestanding separate alternatives to higher education. At least they haven't yet found the golden key to make, to make that happen. Uh, uh, so within higher, so I should say about MOOCs, and I think Rick Levin's gonna say something like this based on his brief description, that uh, uh, Coursera has turned more toward getting revenue from employers or from cooperating with universities that exist to provide versions, sort of think of them as MOOC-like, uh, but not as freestanding things that are just downloaded from the internet. Uh, 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 that seems to be where, where Rick and I think others think that this business is headed. It still can be a very big business and maybe a wonderful way of training employees, but it also comes with a revenue source. Within higher education, an awful lot of people take online courses. A lot of undergraduates take mostly uh, courses that are completely asynchronous. That is, you can, you can look at the lectures or the program uh, whenever you want to. Uh, uh, and for the most part, they're pretty close to digital replication of traditional teaching methods. Uh, they're lectures with some kind of break every 10 or 12 minutes to make sure you're paying attention. Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, they're generally offered in large quantity at uh, large public institutions. Uh, not so much the Berkeleys of the world or, or uh, the you know, most successful national places, but the places that are relatively unselective of students and you're delivering mass education. Uh, in fairness, that mass education on the internet doesn't look very good, but neither does the mass education in a, in a room with 500 people in it taking the same class. Uh, uh, that being said, there have been studies, a handful really, out of thousands of studies that have been reported on. There are really a couple dozen that are legitimate either experiments where students are randomly assigned to be online or face-to-face, or, uh, uh, -face, or good quasi-experiments where there are strong statistical controls that can ground an assessment of effects. And David Figlio, a very good economist at uh, uh, Northwestern University, wrote a, uh, an accessible summary of, of the state of the art uh, at, for uh, Brookings last December, uh, which I recommend. Uh, uh, what he found is that uh, when you look at purely online versus face-to-face -face, uh, test comparisons, as that's the outcome measure, how well you do on a standard on tests that are standardized between the two forms of delivery, are uh, either about the same or a little worse for the online versions as for the face-to-face -face versions. Uh, these online versions, although you would think they should be a lot cheaper, so far actually aren't. And the reason for that is that the overhead costs of producing these things in the first place are very high. Uh, and you need tremendous scale to uh, have enough units to spread the overhead costs around, which, which is sort of the Silicon Valley model. Uh, the difficulty here is you need to get a lot of university, you need one of two things. Either you need a lot of universities to agree to do exactly the same course, uh, which is a really tough thing to sell. 
you know, anybody who'd care to try that with a Berkeley professor, it would be uh, interesting to see who emerged from the room. Uh, 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 but, also, but the alternative would be that the course never has to change. Then you can teach the same course for 20 years. And we all know the names of some people who've actually done that inside of universities. Uh, but you're not going to manage to get scale that way, really. So uh, it's not quite as good or about as good and not cheaper to, in, in the studies that have been done. Now, not everything's been studied. ASU, to my knowledge, hasn't been studied or studied itself. Uh, uh, the big thing is that the results are disappointing for disadvantaged students and first-time college students. And in fact, if we go back to MOOC, to the MOOC for a minute, most of the completed MOOCs are people who've taken, who already have a bachelor's degree. Uh, and that means that they've learned a lot about how to learn things. And they've had, they're also selected as having sufficient self-discipline to, to learn in an, in an unstructured, where, where they have to supply their own structure for the environment. Uh, so, you know, some of the problems I've named, I think, are pretty deep. Some of them may be more solvable than we can envision right now. Uh, I think there are promising things for the, for the longer run. Uh, one is uh, artificial intelligence driving adaptive instruction, and I believe we have an expert on that subject right here. Zach and I met. Uh, do, you, do you all know Zach Pardos? Uh, uh, who uh, came by to see me and told me about the amazing work that he and colleagues are doing on, on uh, uh, adaptive instruction. Uh, as I think he would agree, it's really hard uh, uh, developing this in an effective way. The idea of adaptive instruction is that uh, when a student gets something wrong, the uh, the the machine, let's call it whatever form that takes, uh, can help the student identify what he or she needs to learn. And therefore, in effect, can diagnose their problem to some degree, or at least let them know how other people have, who succeeded have solved the problem. That may be a better description of what you're doing. Uh, uh, it, it, it's a big, it's a big challenge. Uh, it's very likely, at least my intuition tells me, to be more feasible for procedural or algorithmic kinds of things. So teaching rules of grammar, say, in, in English, teaching basic vocabulary and grammar in a foreign language. Uh, if you're more ambitious about understanding, uh, then it's probably a more difficult challenge to program uh, uh, a, a process that will lead you successfully. You know, when I went to the University of Chicago, I was put into honors math. Clearly, everybody makes mistakes, uh, including the placement officials. But uh, uh, for honors calculus, uh, we used Tom Apostle's great and very abstract book, which starts with integration instead of with uh, differentiation, and which it puts a very heavy emphasis on the conceptual foundations. And my instructor, when we got the final exam, about a third of the final exam was state and prove one of the two fundamental theorems of the calculus. And <laughs> I mean, you, you might be able to use at, you know, adaptive learning to reproduce by memory the statement and the proof, but to actually get you to a point where you can comprehend what proof is, it is, uh, I just think, I, I don't mean to deny the long run potentials, but this isn't gonna be an overnight success, I don't believe, and I don't know that anybody claims that it will. Uh, I'll just mention, Deborah Ball, who until recently was the Dean of Education at uh, uh, University of Michigan. We talked about this a little bit. 
Deborah has an exercise that she has done, including with uh, lawmakers, which she uh, uh, displays. She gets them to solve a straightforward multiplication problem, like a three-digit number times a two-digit number. And it takes the legislators a little while, but they s agree on a solution. And then she puts on a screen five or six wrong answers with the work, with, uh, without the work shown. And you're asked, can anybody figure out what mistake the student made? And it's very hard. Uh, it's hard for professional mathematicians to do that. They're not used to thinking about theories of error, right? <coughs> They're thinking about success. Uh, a good fifth grade math teacher has to be able to nail those questions in about 10 seconds to, to diagnose the mistake. Because if all you can do is tell the kid uh, you got it wrong, then all they can do is go back and try to do the algorithm again. But at the end of the day, they're going to end maybe having memorized the algorithm, but they're not necessarily going to know how multiplication works. Uh, so uh, I could see when I gave that example to Zach, his mind was churning with, oh, I'm sure I could do this. You know, let me figure out how to do it. But I, I think ambitious teaching is really hard for human beings. And I think it's going to be hard to model that in uh, computing. Uh, and I'm happy to provide equal time. Uh, so uh, my own view is that in the nearer term, the, the big value of technology for improved outcomes in education, particularly completion outcomes, uh, may not be primarily in course delivery methods, uh, but in process reengineering, as what happened in uh, business with uh, electricity, what happened with uh, computers. Uh, uh, Process reengineering is a bigger idea than uh, using technology, uh, but it includes using technology. So something that schools have shown quite a bit of success with, uh, like Georgia State, Florida State, has been uh, organizing uh, production in such a way that uh, students get very firm advice at the beginning of their education about pathways to success. And then their progress along the pathway is measured aggressively and rapidly. And, and that, that information is then fed up and fed back down so that very quickly, if a student has failed to show up for class for three days, all of that students but show, fail to show up for class at a certain number of their classes, all their teachers will know it. And there will be processes for getting to that kid or adult and finding out what's wrong uh, quickly. Uh, if people get bad grades, uh, they can't progress on the path they're on until some way is found to fix that. And all this happens not when you go see your advisor annually, but like two days after this thing happens. And do that relentlessly, uh, it can make a lot of difference. Uh, uh, it creates an environment which feels less free. You know, and that's a challenge for professors. But uh, it also, if you're looking at a population that has very low completion rates, getting those completion rates up is very high value. Uh, and, a big thing that fits into that, and Zach is working on stuff in this area, is predictive analytics. Uh, that is, on the one hand, what are the key signals that somebody's in trouble? And on the other hand, what are the kinds of remedies that have worked for other students? And having that kind of information from a big data operation either internal to a university or conceivably broader, although universities are so idiosyncratic, I don't know how well it could extend, uh, I think has uh, considerable potential power. And it has shown that power in some cases. Uh, uh, 
the analogy to network building, that is we need networks for using electricity, using the phone, I think is more commonality and consistency in uh, what credit in particular courses means, in what an associate's degree means, and what a bachelor's degree means, so that there becomes more of a common currency across institutions that can facilitate the development of better teaching. If everybody's teaching their own thing, it's very hard to scale that. Even if it's all human teaching, it's still very hard to scale it. But if you have more commonalities, again, something that universities are kind of allergic to, but that, uh, and I don't think it's so much that Berkeley needs this kind of thing. Maybe for some subset of their students, uh, you guys do. Uh, but other institutions that have much less selectivity uh, may benefit a lot from that. Uh, and then I would say, uh, the potential to improve human instruction through uh, digital technologies that gain information about what people are doing as teachers. Uh, there was a huge project by the Gates Foundation in K-12 to videotape very large numbers of teachers, to evaluate those videotapes, and to begin developing feedback systems for what is effective practice based on how these students did, depending on what practices their teachers followed. Uh, there are amazing things technologically you can do to observe classrooms. You can tell, apparently, people can use, can actually, by computers, by looking in, into kids' eyes, can tell if they're paying attention. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that, I don't think it means that you want a computer sitting next to the teacher while she's trying to hang on to the threads of a discussion to you know, have that electronic diagnosis. But it does mean you can tell what techniques encourage people to pay attention, right? And, and it's not gonna be the same in every subject. It's not gonna be the same for every, every teaching goal. Uh, uh, and of course, we have for technologically enhanced courses, we have lots and lots of data being generated automatically in the course of your interaction with the computer. So even if, if you have human instruction, but you do your homework on computers, you can learn a lot from that, and you can learn a lot that could be fed back to producing better teaching. So uh, I don't think any of this is a walk in the park. Uh, I think in the long run, there's going to be huge transformation, which I don't know what it's going to look like. But in the near term, I think there are some next steps that seem really promising for what I think is one of the very biggest problems in our country, which is the failure of so many people to benefit from their experience in higher education. That was way more blah, blah, blab than I ever intended. Uh, uh, my computer here tells me that you all were paying attention every second. Uh, but uh, I would love to get feedback questions. And I'm, I'm looking at you, Zach, too. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Um, one of the things that worries me uh, and concerns me about the attempts to try to do uh, this technological innovation is that I think it's very hard for universities to get the money to do that and actually sort of to take the risk that maybe they're going to do something that's going to mess things up more than help. And so it's hard for us to have the venture capital, and it's hard for us to fear that we're going to take a cohort of students and completely screw them up with whatever we're trying to do. How do we think about that? Uh, I think both those things are real. Uh, 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 it's good if you worry that you're going to screw up a whole generation of students. I'm not sure everybody does, but everybody should worry about that. I think getting capital to do this is in a, in a nonprofit environment is really difficult. And of course, part of the allure of MOOCs was to get out of the nonprofit environment, get out of the institutional environment, to get out of all those constraints. But apparently, it turns out that you're actually paying for something when you have those constraints and so on because people still voted with their feet in that direction. Uh, to some degree, I think consortial stuff can help. I mean, if, if you think about, like, I've worked a lot over the years with liberal arts colleges. And uh, for the high-end liberal arts colleges, the, there are tremendous risks in messing with technology. Uh, besides the pragmatic risk of getting the capital 
and getting, not screwing people up, there is the risk that you, people may think you're having a fire sale, that you're, you're disrupting the intimate relations uh, uh, between teachers and students. So I, I think it would be very appealing to do some of that in a consortial way. Uh, and I think there, could, there actually could be real savings uh, from selective use of technology to, for example, uh, have two campuses where the classics people in one did all of the Greek, the basic Greek teaching, and the other did all of the uh, uh, basic Latin teaching, and uh, shared that electronically. Uh, there were attempts to do that, uh, supported by the Mellon Foundation, which worked pretty well until some people started figuring, Wait, wait a minute. If, if you don't need any Latin teachers here, and I'm a Latin teacher, uh, this may not be in my interest. <laughs> and, uh, that step on the consortium was difficult. But I think those, those, are, those are real hazards. And if there were clear evidence that you could save a lot of money, but there's not. Yes. Anne, right? Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Uh, I have two different questions. One is a very cynical one, which is to the degree that what many colleges and universities sell is not education but credentials. The, um, now, it's probably not true in technical fields. That is, if you turn out engineers who can't do anything, that's a big problem. But for many of us, we're not sure as we teach to what degree what our product is, is actual education or credentials, then I think the, the possibility of, of uh, mechanizing this really suggests also, um, I mean, the danger from the institution's point of view is cheapening the credential, which is one problem. But the other is sort of, well, anyway, I'll just leave it at that. But the other is, and I think maybe Henry is alluding to this as well, the externalities. So, the positive externalities of teaching face-to-face, -face, from my point of view, are supporting the vast infrastructure that produces, in the end, scholars. So if you produce people with PhDs, not all of them are going to become innovative researchers at major universities. Some of them are going to become college teachers. And if you figure out a brilliant way to replace all their labor with people who, with, with very, very good teaching that actually is efficient and produces good outcomes for students, it still seems to me that the externality that produced, which is that there were then a place for the, you know, 15 people enter a graduate cohort of whom three are going to go on to become major researchers, none of them will enter if there aren't jobs for the 12 who happen not to make it. And uh, so a part, I also, but it, ex, what do you have to say about externalities, I guess? I'll well, let me take that second one first. Because I think this is hugely important. Uh, uh, universities are not going to stop relying heavily on people who are not on the tenure track for teaching in any near future. That's just not going to happen. Bernie Sanders wanted to include in his free college thing a law that said that 70% of the the faculty had to be on tenure track. Uh, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that counts as overreach. Uh, but uh, uh, but so, so there is a, a huge problem. I mean, I think part of the solution is that, that places that aren't producing very good PhDs, now I'm not talking about Berkeley here, but, but places that are in this game who don't have the resources to do it well, uh, should stop. We, we're producing more PhDs than we should. I think that's, that's a real problem. And it's not true in every field, but it's true in some fields. It's certainly not true of every university, but it's true of some universities. At least that's my view. But then there is the question of how do you arrange for people who are not on the path to tenure to have meaningful, rewarding careers as Teachers, which is, I mean, most of the work of most professors is teaching undergraduates in most places, right? And, uh, 
at many, many, many of those places, the main thing in people's minds is to get more time for their research. So uh, that's not necessarily going to produce the best teaching or the best research. Uh, and having, as we have professional scientists in the labs at a place like Berkeley, these are people with doctoral de degrees and sometimes postdoctoral training who are never going to be PIs on a big NIH grant, but are going to have a professional career as a scientist working in a lab. We can have professional careers for excellent teachers who get rewarded for their excellence. But not if you displace them with brilliantly designed. That was my question. Oh, I mean. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I wasn't. I, I was. I was addressing the non-computer <laughs> version of this yeah, question. But, but I, uh, I guess I was thinking about what what courses of the brilliant sort. If if it really displaces the second and third tier careers that are available to people who do all the work of becoming scholars. Well, at some at some point, something like that may happen. I mean, you know, that it would become the equivalent of what people think is going to happen to truck driving, right? And then. A big thing is you produce fewer people who will do that for a career in one way or another. I mean, I, but, you know, I'm 70 years old. It's not going to happen while I'm still worrying about anything like this uh, for, for, for institutions that actually value quality. Uh, coming back to your, your first point, I mean, my... My real nightmare, and I think it is a real nightmare, is we don't really have good ways of measuring the, either the learning outcomes or the life outcomes that come from uh, different forms of teaching. Uh, and if you have, to be blunt about it, if you have a population in your state, a subpopulation in your state, that basically your legislature and your other public officials don't really care about. You can deliver incredibly cheap, incredibly bad education for very little cost. You put everything on TV. Uh, and because, you know, if, if you dilute the education we have now, you know, with gigantically visibly overcrowded classrooms, people can see it. Like, you know, you're watering the whiskey. You're not delivering. But when it's a whole different technology, people may not know that that's what's happening to them. Uh, and uh, uh, I worry about this dystopian future where we convince ourselves that we're giving a lot of people credentials. We're really giving them credentials that don't reflect any learning that they did. Uh, I think we have to vigorously, in political and in other ways, combat that kind of trend trend in which you try to do good education and enrich it through technology. And at some point in the future, advance technology to a point where it can really do a lot of really high quality stuff on its own. That, that's a future I think we should aim to arrive at. Uh, I, I, I think it's useful to look at what we're talking uh, about. Talk into the microphone because yeah, we want to record okay. it. It's not because uh, it's, of, is, is it. I don't know that it's doing anything, but I will. He, I think it's, to, it's to useful the guy with the camera so that um, we divide the, the process of acquisition of information or skills or knowledge into the teaching side and the learning side. Because, in a sense, technology is pushing the learning part. At the same time, uh, the individualization of learning in, across the spectrum of people is a pull on finding better ways to acquire information. And I, I think it's important to understand the cultural issues, particularly on the learning side, that um, technology imposes on each generation. And you, you mentioned you're 70. Well, I'm a generation beyond you. <laughs> and for example, I came to the lecture because I would see you as a person and hear you. Yeah. I would not sit somewhere and watch a video yeah. of you giving this talk. And I, maybe people like me are disappearing 
you know, generationally. But uh, I, it, it really uh, places for, it, a huge burden on us to understand and try to come up with the idea of what a university should be. Is it going to be virtual? Uh, are these social networks so independent and immaterial to personal contact? So I think those are huge questions that technology cannot answer by itself. Yeah, oh, I, I certainly agree, cannot in any way answer by itself. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think the, the cultural dimensions of this, uh, not, not only cultures as they evolve over generations, but within a given generation, depending on the kind of experience people have had when they arrive in college. And, you know, I think, you know, a, a, a really good example of this is that uh, people expect now, many people expect that when you show up in college, you will have an iPad, you will know your way around a computer. All of a sudden, this is part of the definition of college ready, right? But wait a minute. You didn't have to change college in such a way that you couldn't go to it unless you already knew that stuff, right? Uh, so college ready is not some independent exogenous force. And it, it, in a country, in a society like ours, it's going to migrate to the convenience of the people with the money. I mean, that they're going to have a much wider range of, of opportunities prior to coming to college. And then we're going to say, well, there's something wrong with these people because they can't do this stuff. You know, it's sort of a version of the, well, I taught it very well, but nobody learned anything. But what do you think teaching means, man? <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, uh, so the lack of flexibility in the universities, the lack of awareness. Uh, I mean, Carol and I were talking about how good it would be for first generation students if it were easier to find your way around the Berkeley campus. Uh, and I speak as someone who has a hell of a hard time finding his way around the Berkeley campus. In fact, my successor had to show up in order to help me find where I was doing my, my thing. <laughs> Do you all know Nayela Nasir, who is the new president-elect uh, of the Spencer Foundation? Yeah. A fabulous choice. So we have time for two more questions. And I see <coughs> two more hands two. in the back and, and Zach. Fantastic. Um, hi, thank you very much for this talk, Michael. Um, I was at uh, uh, Amherst College five or six years ago when Amherst had a very public conversation about whether to join edX and start uh, filming its courses. And uh, after about a semester's conversation, the decision was made not only to not join edX and to not film courses at all. Like you said, this was seen as an existential threat to the liberal arts college. But there was sort of a swing in the opposite direction, in part using money from the Mellon Foundation to support undergraduate research with professors. There's a sense in which this is the opposite. This means that right, professors are spending more individual time with students, and students have more direct feedback from their professors. Now, now being here at Berkeley, I see a very sort of similar decision being made for a similar reason. Berkeley currently has a, a push towards undergraduate research. And I just wonder to what degree you see this as part of a long run trend, how it interacts with the techno optimist or techno pessimist, and uh, what you think of the value of these kinds of, I, I think at least to some degree, new activities being conducted by universities. Can you say a little more about what the, uh, the, the innovation is at Amherst? I'm not. Uh, Amherst received money from the Mellon Foundation to teach five to six person courses uh, oriented around research in the humanities and social sciences, though it was, it was ultimately picked up by the sciences as well, um, to foster undergraduate research participation with professors. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think innovations of, of that kind can certainly be appealing. I, I think it's important to keep in mind whenever one thinks about American higher education, that what Amherst can do, what Berkeley can do, is not typical of what, of what institutions generally can do. And uh, I mean, when I taught at Williams, I taught courses in a major called political economy. And, and I 
would teach with a political scientist, and we would each get a full course credit for that. It's a great learning experience for me, but Jesus, that's expensive. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's hard to pay for. I, I do think, I mean, I'm disappointed that Amherst decided not to join edX. There, there's no contradiction between experimenting with technology and experimenting with innovations in traditional teaching. You know, there was a, a, there's a brilliant sociologist at, at Princeton who uh, produced a MOOC uh, that got into wide use. And he became fearful that uh, that might put some sociology teachers out of work. And he withdrew the MOOC, refused, ex exercised his right not to have anybody ever see it. Now, this is, this is Luddism. Uh, and I, I think we have to use these technologies in the right way, but we also have to be open to them. I, I think, you know, it's, it's a, it's, I think, not the right thing to do, but it's also an imprudent thing to do to slam that door. Because if we think in the broad sweep of American higher education, we can just say, we're doing it fine. Uh, that is definitely not going to work. Uh, Michael, I have a question for you. Okay, given that our universities and colleges are increasingly becoming more multicultural and global in terms of its, in terms of the students, how, how do you think technology is going to fit in there in terms of helping the professors to teach the multicultural? Because they coming from different groups, they have come from different countries, different cultures in terms of how they learn. So, do you see technology as being the great equalizer, the great? Um, you know, help in terms of helping the professors as they teach these classes and these students? That's a, I, I, I think that's a really interesting formulation because the d direction I expected your question to go was whether teaching by computer or with technology would, how does that respond to uh, uh, cultural diversity? And I would be very worried about that in the ways that this teaching is done now. That's not to say that you couldn't have big innovation in that. But, but right now, I would say that that sort of teaching is very homogenizing. It tends to assume everybody is the same. And if you think about the people who are designing these things, probably what they're going to assume is that they're white men. Right. And, and, uh, but you're asking something really different, which is something that interests me very much, which is how can the teachers become better teachers in the classroom through what can be learned through technology and right. through technology-enhanced experiences. And uh, I, I, I think there's potential there. And uh, I think there's similar potential in K-12 education, where uh, you can learn more about the populations that you're teaching. And certainly, the first rule of teaching, of good teaching, is get a handle on what your students already know and how they think about these things. Uh, and if, if you try to, it's when you don't do that that you get into the, well, I taught it well and they just didn't learn it uh, mentality, whereas teaching is an engagement with a learning process. That's the only reasonable definition of what teaching is, whether it's done by a computer or whether it's done by human beings. Zach? Uh, uh, First of all, thanks for that thousand foot view of technological innovation. Uh, analogy is one of the best ways to learn. And I, I, I've thought of several ideas while you were uh, uh, speaking about that. So thanks for that. Um, uh, I'm not a futurist. Um, so I'll, I'll look back to uh, a historical finding in responding to technology as uh, not displacing workers, but perhaps uh, creating um, better pathways to careers. So one of the larger results in intelligent tutoring systems uh, has been uh, students who are just acclimating to a particular topic, at least in STEM. STEM is mostly the area being taught uh, in intelligent tutoring systems. Uh, for those students, if you have the tutor scaffold the experience for them, break the problem down into steps, they do a lot better than the students who are already advanced. So similarly to uh, higher education, when you have first generation, uh, first, um, generation college students, they're often disoriented when they first join. 
Um, and you know, relating to your suggestion about if you could uh, help students find their way around Berkeley campus physically, what if we could help students find their way around the Berkeley campus intellectually, conceptually, make yeah. sense of these dis different disciplines? So you know, AI is a can be seen as a displacing force you see in taxis and so forth, um, but AI and Big data can also help make tangible those normative pathways, yeah. right? Can represent knowledge, can help you find your way by making it tangible and accessible and really democratizing information um, in, a, in a way that helps all orders of learners, right? Yeah. So this information isn't locked into elite circles, right? You can access it, you can know about it, you can know what the normative pathways are to careers and data analytics into whatever whatever career you want to go through. Just, so just being able to consult that information, it's not gonna tell you to do this, but the idea, at least as educators and technologists, being let us get students to a place where they can align their kind of social, emotional representation of the world with the cognitive and then plot their own path, right? So how can we scaffold them with information and technology yeah. so that then they can be um, they can have agency. So, I mean, that's the force that I see data and AI uh, is helping students get to that place where they can chart their path, not to chart it for them. Um, I, just make I, that I think that's great. It's, a, it's an absolutely wonderful example. You showed me a little bit of your early stage work in that direction. And I, I love both the point about the complementarity of technology and human action and the point about uh, people really needing not only literal roadmaps, like I need to find this place, but, but conceptual roadmaps as well. And I, I think that's all really important. I might go a little further and say sometimes you actually should tell people what to do. But, but that's, uh, uh, there's actually, this is a one, one minute point. There's, there's several years ago, President Obama pointed to the ATM as an example of a displacing technology and said, you know, all these tellers are obviously going to lose their, have, all, have lost their jobs. The number of people employed as bank tellers has gone up <laughs> with the greater use of ATMs. And there is a whole new job category, ATM repair. Uh, so uh, our, our intuitions about how this stuff is going to play out aren't very reliable. Uh, and I think it's a great example. Yeah. Well, let's thank Michael. <laughs>